Hello there. My name is Jim Cameron for Talking Kootenai Books. And it's my pleasure to be here today with a, a good friend, an author, editor, publisher, historian, um, longtime residence, Keith Powell. Thanks, Jim. Nice to be here. Well, it's great to talk to you, Keith. And uh, a little different for some of uh, the viewers, because usually you're on this side interviewing other people. But I'm talking to you today because I have your fifth book, I believe. Right. Yes? Yeah, so that's a new book. It's called Kuganusa Burning. So just to give you an idea, I've, I've written uh, five books now. Uh, the first one, uh, In the Shadow of uh, Fisher Peak. Right. Uh, the second one was uh, uh, Raising Cain, which was about uh, Conrad Cain. The next one was really a, a sort of short stories with some fictional element to it called uh, uh, Fisher Peak Chronicles. And then the latest one I had put out was in the in, in the Shadow of Elephants, which is sort of the backdrop of the elephant's escape, which, by the way, uh, w had a great appeal when they had EdFest. I was, I was going <laughs> to bring that up, because the EdFest, I thought, was really quite successful. Yeah, they did a really nice job of that. But the new book, Kukanusa Burning, really talks about uh, you know, the historical account of uh, the flooding of the South Country, which is you know the Waldo um, uh, area uh, on the Kootenai River. And uh, it was a beautiful area. I, I grew up in Jaffrey. I remember as a kid uh, going down and fishing the Kootenai River and uh, the islands that were in the, in the river and whatever. It just always, it, it was something that I always wanted to write about and uh, this sort of gave me a vehicle to do it. Yeah, well, as you say, uh, it, w it was a beautiful piece of land all through there, that bottom land. I recall driving across there many times. It was just like this picturesque, mm -hmm. you know, community and, uh, but, but, you know, back to your book, in particular, I, I found it, and I, 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 I came up with the fact that it's history, mystery, fiction, and fact. <laughs> uh, because it, it's a pretty unique view of a number of things we want to talk about. We'll take them maybe in, in order. Sure. Um, because the first thing is it's cooking or burning, but it's the legacy of the Libby Dam, mm -hmm. which is... Uh, um, kind of piqued my interest right away because wait a minute the Libby Dam is water and here we are talking about burning but right. uh, maybe we won't say too much about that yet there's sure. a I don't want to do any uh, have to do any spoiler alerts in mm -hmm. this uh, so mm -hmm. we'll, we'll try and cover some stuff without giving away all the right. all the plot well you know happens. the tie-in with the Libby Dam of course is uh, that's the dam that they put in uh, right above Libby Montana and, and that backed the water up 42 miles, including the, the large reservoir that we know as Kukanusa Lake right exactly now. Exactly right. And uh, so it's turned into a sort of a recreation mecca. But there was lots of controversy and, you know, personal tragedy uh, at the time because, uh, you know, it displaced uh, probably 40 or 50 families. And that was the most beautiful farmland in, in, in the area. And, you know, we lost that. So there was... Uh, there was uh, a tragic element to it as well. Yeah, there certainly was, and as we were talking about prior to the show here, uh, it really depended on which side of the, the dam you were on. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was a huge economic driver for, for and we see now with Columbia Basin Trust, which we'll mm -hmm. talk about a bit, um, for the Kootenays, and uh, certainly, what is, I think there's about eight states that it provides power mm -hmm. to down in, in the United States. Yeah, no, for sure, it, uh, from an economic standpoint, uh, you know, it's, it, it uh, powers a, a lot of industry, a lot of commerce in, in the United States. And that's one thing that's unique about the Libby Dam. Yeah, if you just go back into the Columbia River Treaty, it involved three dams. That was the Duncan, the Micah, and the Arrow, which is now called the Hugh Kinley Side Dam. Mm -hmm. and, and that was part of that original agreement. And, and really the outlier of the whole equation was the Libby Dam because it wasn't in Canada. It was based in the States. But the impact was felt in Canada because they pushed the water back up into Canada, so yeah, to, you know, to create the reservoir. Right. And the reason those three initial dams were built as part of the River uh, Columbia River Treaty was really to mitigate flood. And so the the states wanted somewhere where they could store and control the water, and and Canada seemed to be the natural place to do that. And of course, through the Columbia Val Columbia Treaty, uh, Canada had a lot of money flow back into. Uh, the yeah, country because yeah. of the storage of that water. Right, it's paid off quite well. But you know, back to the book in particular, all that said, 
um, interestingly enough, I open the book and, and really the first thing I see is, is that really horrible day in, in our history and really Canada's history and aviation history in February, I think February 11th, 1978 when uh, PWA Flight 314 was, was flying from Calgary to land at the Cranbrook uh, Airport, or the Cranbrook Kimberley Airport at the time, and uh, things just went, went horribly wrong. Yeah, so I incorporate that into the book uh, because I, it was a tragic event, and, and in, in some sense I thought it would symbolize maybe some of the tragedy that took place in, in, the, in the region. And, and I use that as uh, just, uh, part of the fictional s historic blend that I, I try and get with the book. And of course, I've developed a couple of uh, his, uh, uh, fictional characters that carry the story. Sure. And they had a, fictionally had a connection to that event. Right, no, I, and uh, as yeah. I said, that history, mystery, fiction, and fact, um, I, I think you do a really nice job of that. It's, it's pretty unique. I mean, I've, all of us that write kind of history books try to do that. I, I've written what I call creative nonfiction. Right. Right. But um, you've got some very definite fiction going here, great fictional characters, but you've, uh, you've placed them in, in very real historic situations and places. Right. And even the way the book lays out, it, it's just a, a kind of an, it's a nice interweaving, I think, of all those facets. Well, thanks, Jim. I, you know, what I tried to do is tell the story in a realistic manner, but not my approach to history is that, you know, people, you, you say the word history and their eyes, uh, yeah, you know, yeah, sort of yeah. uh, glaze over and they sort of lose interest really quickly. Yeah, it's true. So what, what I really have found is you have to have a story to tell. And what I've, I've tried to do th with these uh, fictional characters is tell the story in sort of real time. And so let people know about the history, the background, and maybe some of the consequences and, and the tragedies that were associated with it. And, and that's what I've really tried to do with the, the creation of the novel. Yeah, and, and you've done that very well. I mean, I, I lived through all these events here, being from Cranbrook, and that we're going to talk about the, the plane crash of Libby Dam. Um, and I, I learned a lot of, of really nice background things that I mm -hmm. wasn't aware of. Mm -hmm. And the tie-ins, uh, I always love that kind of thing where you don't realize how, how interlaced things can be until, mm -hmm. until somebody like yourself puts it all together. Um, you know, that crash, yeah, it was horrible. I think there was 40, 43 people killed. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, a good friend of mine at the time was, I think, one of the fellows that walked out of it, mm -hmm. amazingly. Um, but, but you've done, um, aside from the crash, we have a lot of uh, local history that happens. I, I noticed one of the earlier uh, locales that you use is uh, the Diamond Grill in, in Fernie. Right which anybody of us from that era are kind of familiar with, whether you live there or not, yeah, everybody well, stopped in there. I, I said earlier, I grew up in Jaffray, I went to high school in Fernie, and, and, and you know, we spent a lot of time hanging out at the Diamond Grill because that's where you could actually get out of the, <laughs> the, the, the limelight of the school and, and, and you know, the, the kids would relax and whatever. And, and you know, I, I was personal friends with one of the, the sons of the owner, and uh, so it was a, you know, it was just a classic diner kind of atmosphere. and. And I hope I sort of captured the essence uh, of what was going on there in, in sort of in, in the introduction of the book. Oh, in, yeah, in, no, I think you did real well. Uh, yeah, I recall going there, you know, when we went out to play basketball games and things. And that was totally the hangout, right? Yeah, and yeah. a very cool place, and the owners were, were really nice people. Yeah, yeah right? Yeah, very nice family. Um, but, but you also uh, in mentioned the York Hotel in Cranbrook. Mm. Uh, I, I just wondering, I mean, why not, for right. sure, but, but why the York? Well, again, you know, my family, I, I grew up in Jaffray, as I mentioned. Uh, we would come to Cranbrook every two weeks to do our shopping, and we'd always hit the Diamond Grill, or, or, or excuse me, the, the York Hotel, right. and, uh, and we, we would catch lunch there. And so when I was a kid, it made an impression on me, and I tried to relive some of those memories or bring them back through the, through the novel and just talk about that experience. and. Uh, Again, I hope I captured a little bit of the essence of, you know, walking through the narrow hallway into the diner and you could smell the pub and you could, yeah. you know, it was, uh, you know, it, it just, uh, I, I, those kind of details, uh, I think, uh, sort of brings the life into well, the novel. It, certainly, you know, and I'm sure a, a lot of people um, watching are, are familiar with, you know, some of the, 
you know, the art back in the day. And yeah, it, it drew me right in. You yeah. know, immediately I'm sitting there across from the movie theater and, and enjoying, you know, the hospitality of New York. Um, I couldn't help but ask you about your fictional characters because we'll talk about some of the, the historical figures that, that show up mm -hmm. throughout the book. Um, but you've created some, some really interesting fictional characters. Um, I'm just thinking of Crash Cashman Troyer. Now, Troyer Cash Cashman is, is probably the main character, I mm -hmm. think. Mm -hmm. um, Troyer? Yeah. Just pulled that name out of the hat? Yeah, I'm not sure where that came from. But, <laughs> but I, you know, I, I was uh, looking for a character that would tell the story. I wanted a connection uh, to the v Vietnam War. Right. And, and, and when I was when I was a vet. kid, there were a number of veterans that lived in the, the, the Gateway uh, South Country area, and I just knew that that they could tell that story. And uh, as I dug deeper into it, uh, ironically, the main contractor and supplier in Vietnam was a company called Knutson Morrison, who happened to get the contract to build the Libby Dam. I know. And go figure. <laughs> Well, you know, what are the odds there, right? Right. Uh, so anyways, I, I use this fictional character to sort of carry the story. And, uh, of course, he has a connection to uh, looking into the crash of the PWIA flight. Again, a fictional account, but uh, I thought it was plausible. And, uh, you know, again, I just used him to sort of bring life to the story. Yeah, entirely plausible. You know, I'm just thinking for the benefit of, of uh, people watching, uh, because this is set in around here, what we call the, the South Country. Yeah. But you might want to just explain where that is approximately. Sure. So if you uh, drive towards uh, the border, U.S. border, you get to Roosevelt. It's basically the valley over where the Kootenai River flowed. So it's uh, what we used to call like uh, uh, Gateway, uh, Waldo, Grasmere, uh, Grasmere that, that area, so, right. so the South Gate. Country. Sure. And, you know, the uh, Kukanusa flooded into Canada for 42 miles and it, you can st you can see at Wardner that's sort of the top end of it, right? Right, exactly. A and one part of the book I, I write uh, about a and this part isn't fictional. This is uh, a guy named Stanley Triggs, and yeah. in 1970 he got in a rowboat and rowed down the Kootenai River. Yeah, quite an interesting film. And, and right. snapped some incredible shots, uh, of, uh, and all his photos are kept at the Touch Touchstone uh, Museum in Nelson. And I was able to access some of those photos and, and use them in the book just to give it some historical context. But just a little bit of a side note, I uh, tracked down Stanley Triggs and yeah. phoned him and talked to him. The guy, the guy was 93 years old and uh, sharp as a tack. And we talked about uh, his experience and whatever. And uh, he just gave me the green light and he said, I'd love to have you include my story in your book. So yeah. Well, that's great. You know, I was wondering because I wasn't, Sure, um, wh what had happened to him? Yeah, because you know? he was probably in his fifties, I think, when he was d going down the river. In his, yeah, uh, well, I, he became a director of a large museum in Montreal, and he moved out there, and he spent. He, that's where he lives now. Yeah, and I mean that segment is just typical of a, a number of, of segments in your book. That really, I, I think, aside from being really informative, interesting on its own, really helped propel the the uh, the plot. Mm. And, and hold the book together in, in a really kind of neat way. Uh, I hope so, because there's, like you said, there's so many interwoven, interlinked uh, uh, kind of items and uh, events that y when you stop and think about it, are these connected? And yes, there usually is a connection between all of them. Yeah, it's, it's a funny world, isn't mm -hmm. it? It's, it can be kind of a small world at times. You know, I'm thinking too, you have uh, Jake Renshaw, Trace McNamara, Roxanne Stone, a number of others, uh, were those was there any inspiration from anyone in real life, or these, mm -hmm. you know, just nicely imagined and created characters from? Well, uh, you know, you pull your ex your uh, imagination from real life. So, uh, yeah, there's there's elements of uh, of real people in, in all those characters, but uh, yeah, uh, I can't pinpoint anyone in particular. Yeah. But but you know what I try to do is do a composite so that I I, I try to make these people real and, and and sensitive to what was going on at, at that per period of time that they were that they were dealing with and, and try and reflect some of the you know challenges that they went through and some of the things that they had to cope with right well and again i don't want to give away any of the the plot for for readers at this point but um they're all really in, intrinsically caught up in mm -hmm. in the very 
numerous happenings of mm -hmm. this book historically and, and you know. Well, I went history. to school with a guy and I, I just knew his family went through, he, they were one of the families that were displaced by the, the flooding. And I just knew the impact that it had on that family and on him as an individual. And it wasn't just short term, it impacted him for the rest of his life. So, you know, yeah. there is a human element to, to the tragedy that took place. Well, I mean, uh, you, you bring up some names in there and people I know, Jack Sandberg, who's been a, a good friend for, for years and years, and the Traska family. And, and these are people that um, I talk to the grandchildren of, mm -hmm. of some of these families and they're still affected by it. Mm -hmm. You know, it just is such a, a huge part of the family history. And because there was that sense of these, you know, there's some, you know, Waldo was really quite a lovely little community. I don't know mm -hmm. how many people remember it now. And Craig, a very small, Craig rather, a very small place. But um, those families were really pretty tight. Mm -hmm. You know, there was like you say, a farming community and, mm -hmm. and talk about farming, how many, you know, what's the best farming land around here now? Well, it's probably mostly Mm. sitting under, you know, Lake yeah. Kukanusa. Yeah, no, it, it, it was a very rich agricultural area. Plus there was a, a thriving timber industry as well and, yeah. and, and an impact on the wildlife as well. So there, there were many different aspects that that reservoir impacted. And uh, like I said, it, 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 uh, I just wanted to tell that story and sort of document it. It's gonna be 50 years since the dam opened. That's right, it, coming up. 75? Five? Yeah, 75, right. and right. so, you know, it's easy to forget about maybe what took place, and uh, it, it sure and, is. and I just wanted to try and introduce people to the whole history of that without trying to give them a history lesson. <laughs> right, well, um, and you did a really nice job. Yeah, it's, it would be interesting for all the people that vacation on Lake Kukanusa now uh, to have some understanding of what used to be there. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that ties in with um, the fact that these these families, Jack Sandberg, you, you talked to, and, and mm -hmm. because you have some great photos in the book, let, mm -hmm. let me say that, uh, and and that was just neat, you mm -hmm. know, a, a lot of if it was a fictional novel, we wouldn't mm -hmm. have that, mm -hmm. and if it was a just a, a pure history novel, we wouldn't have all all the neat characters mm -hmm. you've created. Mm -hmm. um, but it's I, I certainly enjoyed it, just discovering past mm -hmm. friends showing mm -hmm. up occasionally. Yeah, and somebody like Jack Sandberg, of course, his family was directly affected. Right. And I think there's a picture in, towards the end of the book of Charlie Sandberg's house being burnt. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, that sort of, that photo sort of struck me as, you know, that was the essence of what happened to that valley because they went in and basically bulldozed everything, put it in a pile and lit a match and to it, burn it. And, and burned it. And so that history was gone. It was, it was eliminated. And uh, that's sort of where I got the title Kukanusa Burning is that, you know, for, for weeks on end, you could see nothing but smoke. And then the smoke was coming from the houses and the farms and the, the ranches that were being. Yeah, you know, burned. and as you say, I, I've forgotten that. Yeah. You know, in my mind now, they just fled and the waters came gently up and everybody mm -hmm. moved away with their belongings and was happy ever mm -hmm. after. Mm -hmm. So far from the case, really. And, th and that's the kind of the neat thing about the Kukanusa Burning. Mm -hmm that a dam could create, you know, that kind of a fire because... Well, you know, there is an organization that the Waldo Stock Breeders. Sure, you talk uh, about You know, that. I talk about them and, and they were quite an influential group and they really tried to push back on that and and it just, uh, you know, I think it, fe it fell on deaf ears, but, uh, you know, some of their members, uh, people like Jack I, my uncle used to work for Jack I, so I, I, I remember visiting the farm and the ranch and, and whatever, again, a beautiful piece of property. But you know they tried to resist. They tried to push back on that, and it just didn't go anywhere. Of course, it and, and they got really pennies on the dollar for what their land was. Well, was right. You do mention that yeah. uh, one uh, fellow that had the garage and the, and the, I think an accompanying store or whatever next to it, and they just came and said, "Here's what the land's worth. Mm -hmm. Take it or leave it," because uh, we're taking the land one way or another. Yeah. I mean, that happens. It happens yeah. with highways. It happens mm -hmm. with all kinds mm -hmm. of things. But this, you know, this was a, really a huge, um, a huge blow to these families. I can't imagine. Mm -hmm. to the truth. Yeah, like I said, it has an impact. So what I tried to do, without dwelling on the tragedy overly, right. <laughs> what I tried to do is, is convey that sense of tragedy, and I guess maybe that's why I tied in with the, uh, the, the airplane crash. But there's another airplane that appears in the, in the story as there well. There is indeed. That's one of the mysteries of yeah. your book. Yeah. That's uh, that's the. Um, 
the plane that disappeared while it was flying, well, you can tell us, but I, yeah. I know it was flying from Anchors, of Alaska, I believe, to Great Falls. Yeah. Montana with 40 or 50 people. On right. It. And, and it disappeared, never, has never been found to this day. And uh, yet there are probably, in my mind, a dozen credible witnesses. Well, you talk about them. That uh, said they saw that plane and they saw it go down. And they saw it in distress. Yeah. They saw possible smoke signals. They saw flares. Yeah. And yeah, these were all these were all uh, people spread out yeah. throughout the valley there, yeah. and, and yet officially uh, a huge search was done, and they never did recover anything. But, but it was December, wasn't it? Yeah, it was Gold Mountain, I think, yeah. which is uh, just south of Cranbrook. Right, right, yeah. um, and the weather, of course, wouldn't mm. turn turn quite bad. Right, but you'd think yeah. after all these years. Yeah, I think the most they found uh, you mentioned was a somebody found a, a piece of. Uh, Plexiglass. Plexiglass, yeah. and they spark more. And, and again, that could be rumor, I don't know. But sure. a, anyways, uh, it, it was an interesting, and I heard that story many, many times over the years, and I just thought I, I would try and work it into the book as well. Right, it was, uh, I just, I have it here, it was the C-54 C Skymaster from um, January 1950. Yeah. Yeah, and that, that's quite a mystery. Uh, don't you briefly mention the, a plane up in the Crow's Nest Pass? Right. Yeah. Hey, what's with the plane things? <laughs> <laughs> now, somebody that read the book before I had uh, finished it, and he said, what's your hang-up with plane crashes? <laughs> yeah, I don't think it's a hang-up. <laughs> it's pretty interesting. Yeah, so I, I did try and uh, work that in. Uh, there, There is, uh, again, a, a, a story uh, the, uh, of a plane leaving Comox in the middle of the night. It came over Cranbrook, cleared Cranbrook, and disappeared, and it ran into a mountain in the Crow's Nest Pass. And to this day, you can walk up the mountain and see the wreckage. Sure, I, uh, I, I, yeah. I've asked you, um, I, I have a couple uh, nephews that go up there and mm -hmm. I've seen a lot of pictures. So uh, I, I tried to work that into the story. Yeah. I had Crash uh, go, go in and do an investigation on it and, and that kind of thing. So just, uh, again, just an element that I thought carried the story a little bit, yeah. Yeah, and, and well done. Um, so, yeah, it's just a, I, our own little Bermuda Triangle, or the <laughs> Rocky Valley Trench. Yeah, I think I came yeah. up with that slogan, the B Bermuda Triangle, the Rockies, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you start looking at it, I mean, right, but we know, of course, what... Uh, and there's a bunch of other plane crashes that could be written about as well. So. Hey, now, historic, historical characters, and I enjoyed all of them, because I've done enough research on my own to, to know the background on some of them, so I, I'm glad that you got them out there. Um, we have Emilio... Well, uh, Picariello, but yeah. everyone called him the the Picarello family. Uh, yeah. Families renamed him in for me. Yes, you know, in the seventies, certainly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, we have uh, Kootenai River Road Captain Frank Armstrong, yeah. and a unique character who uh, I think our Lieutenant Governor of the day of BC said, uh, "Yeah, Captain Frank." He said uh, he he. He hit a lot of scenery <laughs> on the <laughs> way, but he always got the boat through, right? Yeah. Um, or yeah. Stanley Triggs, he yeah. talked about that. Yeah. That was new to me. I really enjoyed hearing about Stanley. Um, William Bailey Groman, yeah. right? Uh, we'll talk about these. David Thompson. James Wardner, to me, un undoubtedly the, the quirkiest and, and most entertaining of the entire bunch. Yeah. But let's just touch on it a little. Um, so we have Emilio Piccarello, or, or Emperor Pitt. Yeah. Why? You know, how did I tie that in? Well, uh, part of the story is that uh, uh, down in the, the Newgate uh, area, they, they used to have a, a like uh, a festive time when they'd get together and have a dance. Yeah, right. And they, they came up with an interesting name. They called it the Mulligan Dance. Yeah. And, and I couldn't figure out why that was the case. No, I didn't know that until I read it. And uh, so evidently it, they made a mulligan stew and everybody came in. It was like a potluck supper. Uh, but fictionally, I have uh, Emperor Pick show up and, and and dance with one of the one of the characters in the book. So just just again, just a, a tie-in that's fictional, but again, sort of Ooh. allows me to talk about the history. Listen, uh, and, and you know, going back, that was his route. Right. I was just going to say. You know, he was a notorious bootlegger, <laughs> right. and, he, and he used that crossing. <laughs> that that was his uh, you, you, crossing of choice. Yeah, you can bet he wasn't just dancing with one of the girls, who probably had a, uh, selling a few. Uh, <laughs> You know, a liquid goods out of the back of his <laughs> his uh, Ford Ford vehicle, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and if I'm not mistaken, he ended up being uh, tried for murder and hung in that's Saskatchewan. Right. Yeah, along with a woman accomplice, which that's right, too. which I think has that's been right. uh, 
exonerated to some degree recently. Really? Yes. Well, there we go. This mm -hmm. is, we're going to have to get another book out there <laughs> on that. Um, you know, Frank Armstrong, a lot of people don't realize uh, how, how um, important the riverboat travel was in the early days. Of well, the you know, we used to have the sign before someone stole it on Steamboat Hill uh, that talked about the, uh, you know, the, the steamboats on, on the Cooney River. And, uh, you know, it, it was a thriving trade. Uh, James Wardner, Frank Armstrong, uh, the, they uh, they were essential, like, you know. In fact, that was the the essence and the start of the you know the Sullivan Mine. They took the ore f from the so mine they, to yeah. uh, the river, uh, North Star Landing, and put it on the, on the steamship. Took it down to Jennings, Montana, and put it on the railway there, and took it to the smelters. So you know, there's a, a historical connection. Sure. Well, I know the folks at Fort Steele. Sometime in April, would get up and start dancing and singing when they saw the steamboat coming up. Mm -hmm. the river and bringing goods they haven't seen for five or six months. I, I think it was Frank Armstrong, I think the first time he, he was for Sealy, he walked down from Golden in winter on his snowshoes, mm -hmm. went back and built a steamboat and said, I'm not doing that anymore. <laughs> a great character. Um, yes. He ended up in Egypt yeah. uh, at one point on the Nile River. Yeah. You know? um, well, that's the thing about many of these characters in the Kootenays. Uh, they have such a colorful life. Oh, no kidding. And, uh, you know, I, I tried to capture some of that, but, I mean, each one of them, you know, could have their own... Right, look. yeah, no, I mean, you do a great job of just uh, giving us a nice hint of, of the character and some of their background and, uh, and how it relates to your, to mm -hmm. your novel. Mm -hmm. right. Speaking of which, uh, a novel, is that a, a good description? I call it a historical novel, yeah, it's sort of a, a, a word that I use yeah. or a term that I sort of coined myself because what I do is I try and take as many historical facts as I can and then build a story around it sure. that will carry those, those facts. And, and you know, it's not like I'm trying to make up history, I, I'm trying to tell the story through the eyes of fictional characters. Yeah, and what you do that, that I certainly appreciate and I'm sure a number of readers do is um, you bring the history in, but you keep it accurate, mm -hmm. which is kind of nice. Yeah, you know, we know from from Hollywood and television how how they can start, you know, changing changing the uh, facts to fit the fit the fiction. Well, I, I can't say I'd never done that, but oh, I, no. I try not to. Well, there's a yeah. thing called I think uh, you know, <laughs> creative license yeah, or something. Yeah, like certainly. <laughs> well, because uh, story is important, as yeah. you say. You know, if you don't have a good story, uh, people sometimes just think, yeah, mm -hmm. I think that. So. Um, yeah, you got to do what you got to do to <laughs> to make it go across. Um, did you learn anything new along here, along the way? You know, you learn something new every time you take on a project like this. Yeah, I mean, a so. and the thing that maybe stood out in my mind is all the connections. All everything is connected so one way or the other, and, and that's what I try to do is bring some of that together, which seemingly isn't connected, but when you start to look at it, is uh, connected in one way or another. Uh, it sure is, and I mean it, it's so connected to uh, present day. Yeah, I mean we drive we drive over mm -hmm. the Cucanuso across the bridge there mm -hmm. all the time, and you just don't think of all the things that um, mm -hmm. go to, to doing that. Yeah, you know. Well, we, but I hope people will take the time to you know read through the book and just uh, maybe discover some of that history, and and see that it still is relevant to what we do today. Well, I mean mm -hmm. they can't help but mm -hmm. you know. Keith, listen, it's, it's been great, a gr great chance for me to sit here and, mm -hmm. and do your job for you. Yeah, thanks, Jim. It's been a pleasure to chat. Yeah, I, I, I've been speaking today with, with Keith Powell, um, author of his latest book, Kukanusa Burning, uh, Legacy of the uh, Libby Dam. And uh, on behalf of Talking Kootenai Books, I'm Jim Cameron. Thanks for watching. <laughs>